Dark greetings, everyone. Dark greetings to you all. It is a time, season for healing, ladies and gentlemen, and I am here for it. Welcome, welcome to VAMP, good-hearted white folks. Give it up for yourselves, ladies and gentlemen. You made it out. You made it out on a Thursday, and we're not even college age. Yes, you did it. Welcome, welcome to you all. Thank you for coming out. I am your host for the evening, show producer, so say we all, board member, and handsome boy modeling school graduate, Dustin Markell. Thank you, thank you. Let's get started. Uh, first things first, you may have noticed that we are at a bar. So during the show, if you could please pass your empty glasses towards the back so that the bartender can keep those drinks flowing. You may have also noticed that we are at a performance. And so uh, if during the show, the folks around you are getting a little too chatty, don't be afraid to turn around and mad dog them for a little while till they get the message. We want to hear these stories, fam. I mean, do you want to hear these stories, fam? I don't know. I don't know if y'all really want to hear them. Y'all kind of chill right now. I don't know if y'all really want to hear them. You know, we can take our stories and go. All right. I know y'all want to hear them. I know you want to hear them. Uh, but first of all, I want to do my spiel. Uh, uh, talk about So Say We All. Who are we? In case you don't know, we are a literary and performing arts nonprofit. Our mission is to create opportunities for people to tell their stories and to tell them better. So Say We All is also a community not just among its performers and volunteers and board members, but among its audience too. We love sharing our experience with you and we want to hear all about yours. We feel that the arts help make San Diego a city we all want to live in. And we hope that our shows help people feel a little less crazy in these crazy ass times. <laughs> As a community, we hope not only to laugh and cry with one another, but to listen and to learn from one another and to honor the experience of our storytellers. Tonight, as you hear tales of misguided good deeds, of cringeworthy virtue, of people desperately trying to just do the white thing, <laughs> you may be tempted to hear these stories and say, well, that's all well and good, but certainly, they're not talking about me. <laughs> and so in the spirit of receptiveness in this season for healing, in lieu of our typical greeting among the congregation, I want you to turn to your neighbor, to the people around you, and tell them warmly, lovingly, invitingly, hey, they talk about you. Take a few minutes and do that for your neighbor to say hello to them. Turn to them and say, yo, they talking about you. <laughs> no, they talking about you. <laughs> they talking about me? <laughs> they talking about you. Okay. Okay. All right. Look at that. We feel it. The he Let the healing begin. Let the healing begin, ladies and gentlemen. Let it begin, fam. All right. Don't y'all feel better right now? Y'all walked in, we're like, oh shit, good hearted white people. Is that the show? Is gonna, do you wanna go this vamp? I don't know, but you made it, fam. And we got that out the way, and knowing is half the battle. Tonight on our lineup, Alejandro Lacerda Canan shows us what happens when keeping it real goes right. Liz Thomas shows us just why it's a bad idea to play with dolls. Deborah Bass finds herself smack in the middle of a thumb war, a patrician. <laughs> Laura Preble learns just why no good deed goes unpunished, while Jake Arkey learns that with great power comes little to no accountability. <laughs> but first, coming to the stage, I want y'all, before I even do that, I want to, here's what I want you to do. I want y'all to start with like a little like kind of golf clap, right? And then as I go a little bit higher like this, I want y'all to get louder. 
Well, I go with highlight this one, get a little bit louder now, a little bit louder now, a little bit louder now. Bring it back down, bring it down, bring it down, bring it down, bring it down, a little bit softer now, a little bit softer now. Let's keep it a little soft. Let's start with the golf clap right now. Let's get a little higher. Right, right. First coming to the stage, he is the dream of our ancestors or the nightmare, depending on your family tree. Fam, show some love. Get it up, get it higher for a Jeopardy champion and first time for fan performer, Professor TJ Talley. It's a delicate dance being a snarky black person in a world of whiteness. A few years ago, as a tired graduate student, I wrote a blog post called, There Are No Good White People. <laughs> now in it, I wrote that the idea of being a good or safe white person is a dangerous story that white people tell themselves. One that ignores the fact that for black people in the United States, any white person could, at any moment, access the power of a white supremacist state to end the life of a black person. Now, I was not, to be clear, accusing all white people of being bad, <laughs> but I was pointing out that whiteness bestows upon a person a credibility directly at the expense of a black people. Now, at any point, a white person could call the police, could allege victimhood or attack, and have a higher likelihood of both being believed and having access to state resources, like the police, for assistance. Now, while I was earnestly trying to share the lived reality I felt as a black person, I didn't quite anticipate just how good-hearted white folks would respond. So, <laughs> you see, whiteness also confers upon itself an innocence an erasure of the very processes of violence that allow white people to move without racial terror within the United States. Now this access to state violence, this ability to hurt, then is erased in the minds of those who possess it. And to call that out, it has hefty consequences. The nasty emails came in trickles over time. The angriest were directed to the administration at a university in rural Virginia where I had my first professor gig. Yeah. Now, these emails demanded that I be fired for my vile racism against all white people. <laughs> now, of course, by trying to get me fired, to translate their discomfort into my dismissal, these anonymous reviewers were once again proving my very point for me. Now, I had punctured the balloon of innocence, of goodness, and for that, <laughs> I deserved every manager a Karen could find to make me be quiet. Now, after repeated email harassment, I just took the blog post down. I was so very tired of trying to fight it. And it wasn't my job to educate everyone, just the people I taught in my history classes every day. But in 2020, I read the coverage of Amy Cooper and her interactions with black bird watcher Christian Cooper. So, y'all remember. Now, after a tense encounter over her unleashed dog, Amy made false accusations to the police that Christian was threatening her, which he recorded in a video that went viral. And I couldn't help but return in my mind to that blog post. What was fascinating, utterly, was that Amy Cooper genuinely believed herself to be innocent, to be good, to not be a bad one, as did the hundreds of white people I saw denouncing her and her vile actions. Now, the very act of disavowing Amy Cooper served two purposes. It allowed people to rightfully condemn racist violence, bad, but it also allowed white people to imagine themselves, once again, as innocent, as not those kinds of people. Yet from experience, black people know that all white people, at any time, have the potential to hurt them, to access histories of racial power and violence against us. Now, this does not mean that all white people are equally positioned in society. White folk can be marginalized in so many other ways. But they do get the particular benefit of the doubt in their whiteness. And they do not have the added factor of being black in a society that is routinely set up to punish, hurt, and minimize us. 
As Amy Cooper felt angry or humiliated, she then could turn to a tool she inherently knew would protect her and would punish the black man in front of her. It was the tool that so many white people have access to, whether they want to admit it or not. It is a fundamental power relationship that white folk are really invested in ignoring. And nor does this mean, and I am weary of stating this, that white people are some sort of vaudevillian villains twirling mustaches on the hunt for black blood. No. One of the more exhausting conversations black people have with white people routinely involves white people's intent in a racist society. I am violently uninterested in whether or not Amy Cooper imagined herself to be a racist when she committed an undeniably racist and cruel act. White folks specifically want to be reassured that they are the good ones, that they cannot do bad. And if they did, they are irredeemable like Cooper. But as Jay Smooth once said, I'm uninterested if a pickpocket imagines himself to be a thief. I just want my wallet back. <laughs> so what does it mean to benefit from violence? Violence that you didn't do, but violence that you could still trigger at any moment. It's fucking hard to look at this, at that weirdness, at that discomfort. Very few people want to be the villain in their own stories. And that's where goodness comes in, like a shield. It's a natural impulse, this desire to be good. But it also denies the reality of existing in a shitty, broken, exhausting world. Focusing on being good is a way of escaping from those feelings, from those histories, and instead also trying to imagine that there aren't tensions or complications in your everyday relationships with black folks. So to think about this, let's go back to my time in Virginia. So I'm originally from Southern California, but I spent four years living and working as a professor of African history at Washington and Lee University in Lexington, Virginia. <laughs> So for those of you who are unfamiliar, Washington and Lee is named after two ever so sassy Southern slave owners, George Washington and Robert E. Lee. Yes, that one, who both contributed to the growth of the school. It's a picturesque white columned series of buildings nestled in the hills of the Blue Ridge Mountains, built by and supported with slave labor and home to a generally white and wealthy student body. It was a lot, y'all. <laughs> like Confederate reenactors invading the town once a year a lot, y'all. Like having the police call and offer me protection after being doxxed for planning the first annual Martin Luther King Day parade, y'all. Like being one of four black faculty at the university where I was teaching African history 200 feet from the grave of Robert E. fucking Lee and trying not to have a panic attack lot, y'all. I called it Confederate Hogwarts. <laughs> You're a grand wizard, Harry. When I arrived, on campus a few months after my 30th birthday. I wouldn't say that I was naive about what I had just moved to, but I do think that I was hopeful. I thought that I could come in and challenge the heavy, exhausting realities of the place by purposefully, joyfully taking up space. So how do you dress when you are a queer, black, brand new professor at Gone with the Wind University? I knew I wasn't ever gonna fit in. Right, I mean, no pair of salmon pants, no blue blazer was gonna make me look like I belonged. So I responded by going, full steampunk. Seriously, I kept a whole fashion blog about it called Clockwork Black. I had handlebar mustaches, bow ties, waistcoats, pocket watches. Big afros. I had a student tell me that I looked like a backup dancer in an antebellum Janelle Monet video. 
And she was right. <laughs> and I loved trying to carve out a space like that. But nothing really prepares you for the daily lived reality of existing in a black body, in a space that was explicitly not designed for you. In a space tiled brick by brick with the brutal realities of enslavement, the realities of Confederate flags, and threats to my safety all the time. And this is where the nature of good white people became really clear. There were plenty of white professors in Lexington who abhorred the casual racism, who felt it was awkward and terrible. But they had also, in some ways, made peace with the place. It was a relatively decent place to raise a family of a certain hue. The pay was good, and the landscape was indeed very pretty, especially if you're one of those people that like hiking. Um, <laughs> there was also the weird, jarring reality of polite white society in Lexington. There were plenty of people who wanted to help, who saw racism as bad, but who also didn't like being uncomfortable and didn't like us being loud. And that, that fucking hurts. When we first organized that Martin Luther King Day parade, which was not so coincidentally the weekend that the Confederate reenactors came to town every year and terrorized folk by menacingly waving flags on street corners and staring extra hard at the few brown folk around. <laughs> we had a considerable number of local white Lexingtonians that were instead concerned that we were causing the problem. I don't support racism in any way, TJ. <laughs> They would tell me over coffee or in quickly written, often uncapitalized emails. <laughs> but aren't you doing too much? Like, this is confrontational, and maybe we could just not rile up the Confederates. One woman, a local member of the Chamber of Commerce, insisted that there should be a neutral third group, not one supporting the Confederates, or Martin Luther King. <laughs> but that instead supported free speech for all. Now this, she said, is what good neighborliness would be like and being a good community member, something Martin Luther King Jr. would have wanted. <laughs> so, this is the exhausting problem of goodness. It's a weirdly flexible concept. It's a Teflon shield of self-projection that keeps you inured from the actual realities that other people are undergoing, the actual other risks that they're experiencing, because you're so damn focused on you and on maintaining some sort of good person credit rating. And when I hear that, it stings. I feel the bile rise in the back of my throat. I see the performance, the mask that doesn't see me as real. I'm simply a background image as someone chooses their comfort over my safety yet again. I think here in Southern California, somewhere like Lexington seems blindingly obvious, right? This sense of, well, okay, that's racist. <laughs> it's a space where the violence of the history weighs heavy and exhausting. But let's not get it twisted. Good white folks exist here in abundance. Indeed, by thinking racism only exists in places like Lexington. It's real easy to gaslight folk and say, well, there aren't real problems here. When police killings happen in places like San Diego with astonishing racial impunity, and now that I'm back from my time in Virginia, white folk often give me a knowing nod and say, you must feel so much safer here. I mean, sure, less Confederate flags are always great from a blood pressure, but Virginia doesn't have a lock on being built one brick at a time by histories of racist violence or exclusion. There are plenty of places that people can enjoy attending that might still be largely built on and lived through exclusion. It might be hard to feel like a cool hipster bar in an expensive San Diego neighborhood is a space for you to breathe or survive if someone could have their own Amy Cooper moment at any time. So the real problem with good white folks, y'all, is that goodness is performative. It's wanting to occupy a specific space, to earn credit, and to earn kudos. It's turning the world around you into a musical and expecting the actual people with skin in the game to be your background dancers. 
It's like being Sandra Bullock in The Blind Side. <laughs> you know, in the movie about an actual black athlete's life that becomes about the nice white lady who helped him. And it's not about understanding why folk aren't as eager to praise your goodness because they're the ones that are actually suffering. In this way, people like Amy Cooper are not unlike asymptomatic carriers of the coronavirus. <laughs> they live their lives thinking they're fine and healthy, functioning in this society. And yet without warning, their body could bring harm to someone like me. A fact that absolutely surprises them. And yet when I point this out to folks, I sometimes encounter an almost belligerent innocence. And I am fine and I am safe and I am good and how dare you suggest otherwise that covers a genuine fear that if they were not safe, that if they were not healthy, that something would be gravely wrong. But something is gravely wrong, y'all. Violent histories stretch behind us like those ivory columns did at Washington and Lee, casting long shadows into our lives. And these silent histories carry the potential to turn an everyday interaction into a lethal one for black folk. Goodness hides the reality of these histories from all of us. Goodness demands a spotlight to take the focus from other people's lived risks and experiences. Goodness is a dodge and a distraction, a sense of security that doesn't think who might be more at risk. So to return to my spicy blog post of a few years ago, maybe there can't actually be good white people, just people who do the work without affirmation who don't prioritize their feeling safe and right and proper over the risks that other people feel every damn day. Scene one, it's 2022, and I'm back on campus for winter break for my teaching job. She walks into my office, uh, an acquaintance of an acquaintance, and loudly proclaims, I'm so disappointed in you. When I heard you ate turkey for Christmas dinner, I was expecting something else, something more Mexican. <laughs> Whoa. I barely know this person, suddenly invading my space, but now I also have to respond with what? Anything that a Mexican cooks in Mexico is some type of Mexican food? Uh, not to mention that, especially in these borderlands, the cultural exchange runs deep enough to create what I had for Christmas dinner that year, turkey, romeritos, and bacalao. And I could go into the fact that guajolote is indigenous, but what's the point? <laughs> Who are these people walking around with expectations of what I should look, how I should talk and be, that have little tiny Mexican meter to judge me with? <laughs> <laughs> the, the truth is, I'm never truly ready for these interactions. And they happen so frequently too. If I were to carry each and every one of them on my back, I would never get up from bed. And though I'm angry, very angry, I try to keep it light for my sake. So I just laugh to her and say, <laughs> I'm not really sure what you mean. Then I proceed to explain the whole dinner and thankfully, it is just Mexican enough for her liking. <laughs> she approves. I am so relieved. In case you didn't know, when a random white woman challenges a Mexican's Mexican rep and you don't have your documents ready, Mexican ICE shows up and takes away your Mexican passport <laughs> and they ban you from all the taco shops in Mexico. <laughs> Nobody wants that, right? I was so glad to be Mexican enough to pass. When you take a quick look at me, you may assume that I'm just a Mexican that assimilated into American culture. 
but I'm a Mexican that never wanted to be American. I'm just a Mexican that struggled when I first came to this country and I did what I had to do to survive. Scene two. It's seventh grade and my parents start taking me to a school in San Diego with the hopes that I would find a way to build a better life in El Otro Lado after an entire life in TJ. But I was not ready. I was excited that my new school had those color Mac computers, <laughs> which to me signified the first world. You know, the first world trifecta for an 11-year-old, Mac computers, Big Macs, and macroaggressions. <laughs> I mean, Mac and cheese, Mac and cheese. <laughs> Let me try that again. What crossing the border meant to me was a, change, was a chance to get a life that I couldn't explain. But my parents thought it was better than what I could have had in TJ. So I went with it, excited, full of the dreams that Saturday morning cartoons had sold me. Hopeful that tons of Hot Wheels and Super Soakers, because that's what my little gay soul wanted. <laughs> and though reading and writing in English came easy, talking, forget about it. Immediately, I was ostracized from my entire class as a weirdo that couldn't speak. I knew enough to get by, but I didn't understand slang. I couldn't translate things from one language to the other fast enough. And I still lived in TJ, while all my classmates were American. So I didn't even get to share key childhood experiences. I missed sixth grade camp. I didn't do the California Missions Project. Nobody knew who El Chavo del Ocho was. <laughs> it was very hard to bond. I. I probably cried every day as I crossed the border into this horrific land of torture, loneliness, and grief. The American dream. What a beaut. <laughs> Scene three. I'm in high school. I've shaken my accent loose and developed a cool, detached, don't give a fuck about people attitude. <laughs> I dress American. I consume American. Still live in Mexico. I am only Mexican around Mexicans in Mexico. For everyone else and everywhere else, I try to keep it ambiguous. I just want to be accepted. At my school, we have a group of Mexicans from Tijuana we call Los Soch or Socials. The ladies wear makeup, hike up their skirts. The men always play soccer and have handsomely done hair. They all speak Spanish the entire school day and have Nextel phones that beep loudly when used for radio calls to Mexico. <laughs> Even though I was from Tijuana too, it was too late for me to be a soch. I would hide my Nextel in my backpack until after school, and I didn't speak Spanish until I was safely home. With my rejection of makeup, fashion, and a preference for nerdy shit like reading Harry Potter and watching anime, I was probably not Mexican enough for these soch either. But I was certainly too Mexican for my white, well-intentioned speech teacher. <laughs> now picture this. It's my mandatory speech class, and we're assigned to write some speech, which I dutifully do, because I have no friends to distract me. <laughs> At this time, I'm also semi-famous in some internet circles for my fan fiction. So this speech, easy A. <laughs> Soon enough, she returns the paper with a big fat F and a mean ass note about how I could not have possibly written this. My face is red with rage. I'm shaking. Are you fucking kidding me? At that point in my life, you could have easily questioned me about all kinds of things. Whether or not the pants I'm wearing are perhaps a little too baggy. Whether or not I should consider at least washing my face to see if my acne will improve. <laughs> or whether or not I'm queer and in love with my best friend. <laughs> but to question my goddamn writing skills. 
accuse me of plagiarism. Fuck no. I turn around, run to my locker, and grab my latest A-plus English essay. I stomp back into her classroom, my glasses reflecting the fluorescent lights that have surely impacted her judgment. I shove the English essay to her, on her face. See, I write like this, I didn't steal anything. She's stunned. She reviews my essay and takes my speech, crosses out the F and gives me a C. There, at least you're not failing. I feel demoralized, unseen. I produced that work. That's me right there on that page. Denied. When people know I'm Mexican, they see me differently, if they see me at all. But at least this wasn't as bad as another time when a professor thought he knew more about being Mexican than me, a Mexican Mexican. <laughs> Scene four. This time, fast forward to grad school, where I'm working on a full-length play as my English creative writing master's thesis at CSU Northridge. My professor is a white dude, like 100% Irish white, who thinks that it's cool to write and perform a play in blackface. This is, by the way, 2014. Now, we all know America's been racist and will continue to be racist, but by 2014, we knew blackface was wrong. Anyway, that's my thesis director, a very charming guy. So I'm writing this play uh, about the border that's got a very strong magical realism structure to it and it involves my key character crossing the desert to meet the love of her life and build this American dream in El Otro Lado. I can't help but think my thesis director doesn't like me or my writing, but also he doesn't get any of it. He's constantly sending back drafts with uncalled for and ignorant critiques. Like, I have a character use the word delicatessen, and he forbids me from using it in the script. Apparently, that's not a word Mexicans would use. Even though I stole the name from a local cafe in TJ. <laughs> he also doesn't understand why my female characters stay and take care of the home instead of working and why they seem to spend a lot of time in each other's houses just talking? <laughs> like, who does that? Mexican cheese make culture, anyone? <laughs> but the biggest and most violent feedback came when, in a meeting with him, he tells me that I need to add chance to my border crossing scene. I will not sign your thesis off. You will not graduate this semester, he threatens. He chants a Navajo-esque, John Wayne, white imaginary bullshit. <laughs> These are sacred songs he's referring to. Songs, of course, which I won't appropriate. But I don't even think I have to because y'all are racist and know damn well too well what I'm talking about. This is not the way a lot of indigenous people from southern Mexico do things, by the way. I did not want my play colonized, but it was. I felt I had no choice. Why would I tell my parents if I didn't graduate? So I wrote that shit into my play. My racist play is out there, published by my university racist as fuck. <laughs> I hate it. I stopped writing for years after this fucker ruined my work. And I have never forgotten what it felt like to sit there, Mexican as fuck, being told by this white dude about my culture. Worse, using his power and privilege to subjugate me to his will. These, my formative years, have done quite a number on me and my relationship to my identity in America. And I stay angry, 
because these things keep happening to me. But I've also learned what being true to myself really means. On a date, my wife asks me why I didn't dress like a lot of the Chicanx people we knew, if I too was Chicanx. I don't typically wear those embroidered blouses from Oaxaca or stunning beaded ritual earrings. I don't have a cuatlique tattoo on my body. Mm, I'm shrugging that response. This is what this proud Mexican looks like. Y a todos los pinches haters out there, váyanse a la chingada, cabrones. The question, what are you? followed me around like a bad odor for much of my childhood, which morphed into the more politically correct, so where are you from? At the end of the day, what people want to know is my race. My mom and dad met in Japan during the Korean War. They fell in love after dad got drunk one night Dad had caused quite a ruckus at a pachinko parlor, knocking over a pachinko machine. He was arrested, and my mom was working at the police station as an interpreter. This is where they fell in love. <laughs> it wasn't easy for my parents. The military had obstacles to prevent marriages between enlisted men and foreign nationals intimidation, filling out many forms, undergoing endless interviews, and even medical tests, which all seemed to be what they needed to do for the sole purpose of discouraging mixed marriages. And my parents faced many stares and much hostility when they were together in Japan, which was still a very closed society but they knew all along that their lives together would eventually be back in the US. My mom was sent stateside to be with my dad's family during her pregnancy with me. I was born in Corpus Christi, Texas, but my family moved back to Japan shortly after I was born because dad was stationed at Tachikawa Airfield. On the way back to the airport to catch our flight back to Japan, my family stops for gas. The gas attendant was cleaning the windshield and looked at my parents, then at me in the back seat. The attendant asked, say, where is that baby from? Did you steal her from the reservation or what? What is she? So it went on from there. I remember as a kid, a kid, adults would ask me, what are you? They wanted to know my race, of course. In the early 60s, asking a kid, what are you? Perfectly acceptable. As a kid, I tried to answer as best I could. No guile or, or sarcasm, you're just a kid. After a while, you get tired of the question. No kid wants it pointed out to them that they are different. You wish people would just let it rest because whatever you answer, a short answer isn't enough. The answer Mexican Japanese is never enough. I always had more explaining to do. What kind of food do you eat at home? Is your dad Japanese or is it your mom? Do you speak Spanish? Do you speak Japanese? Mm, I speak a little Spanish and oh, no Japanese. Oh, too bad. Yeah, I get it, I'm a big disappointment. <laughs> then I have to explain how my mom didn't speak Spanish and my dad didn't speak Japanese, but they both spoke English, but still, too bad. 
And then there were all the nods. Yeah, I knew it. I could see the Asian in you. It makes people feel good somehow. People get happy when they peg my race, kind of like pin the tail on the donkey. Do I look more Asian? Or is that what people want to see? I begin to wonder, is that somehow more desirable? Where did I fit in? It didn't help that I didn't see anyone who looked like me on TV. Everyone on TV was your basic vanilla. And nothing exciting at all, but they all fit in. Then, bam! The TV show, The Avengers, aired. I found my role model, Mrs. Emma Peel, super spy. Mrs. Peel was white, tall, slim, dressed sexy, had beautiful wavy hair, not the flat Asian stuff on my head, and she could kick ass. She was witty with clever comebacks in a British accent. So I made up my mind. I would grow up to be her. I would be Emma Peel. I would be white, tall, with curls in my hair. I would dress sexy, and I would kick ass. Well, it didn't exactly pan out that way. But hey, I made sure I could kick some ass. It explains my lifelong love for boxing, Krav Maga, and various martial arts. I carried that little bit of confidence in me that yes, if I had to, I could kick some ass. But I sure, I was sure I was not good looking at all. This longing to fit in wishing maybe I could pass at someone who didn't bring up the question, what are you? I lacked confidence. I had plenty of self-loathing, explaining my desire for wavy hair, or what I call Caucasian hair. I made sure my hair was properly curled for every school photo. Maybe I couldn't change my height, my skin color, or the shape of my eyes, but my hair, there was something I could work with. So I would always perm my hair. I would endlessly burn my hair to achieve that perfect wavy hair. For much of my life, my hair was sizzled and damaged. No matter what I did, though, curl my hair, shrink back into the shadows as a shy, quiet person, People would stop and question what I was or where I was from, pointing out to me again and again that I just didn't fit in. I could be walking down the street and a random person would start talking to me in Tagalog. <laughs> oh, oh, gee, I don't speak Tagalog. I'm not a Filipina. Oh, yeah, I didn't think so. It's your nose. So. So what are you, Hawaiian? Guess what's going on in my head? Well, why the hell were you trying to speak to me in Tagalog if you knew? <laughs> so you're Inuit, right? Inuit, like, like an Eskimo? You, no, I'm not Inuit. You sure? You look just like my aunt. You're sure you're not Inuit? As if. My racial identity was a mystery to me. So many Native Americans start speaking to me in their language, but at the end of the day, they always ask me, so what are you? By the time I was a teenager, I developed a big chip on my shoulder. When people asked me where I was from to mess with them, I would say, well, I was born in Corpus Christi, Texas. <laughs> then they would fidget a bit, <laughs> Re regroup. Well now, where is your family from? You know, your people. And I'd smile, oh yeah, my people. Well, they're all from Corpus Christi, Texas too. It was 
easy and enjoyable to make fee people feel as uncomfortable as I did. And later, so many men seemed to be fascinated with my exotic looks. Not beautiful, but exotic. Men have told me my exotic looks are a turn on or that my soft Asian skin turns them on. I have been called a pretty Chinese doll more than once. This I do not take as a compliment. It is irritating. It's creepy. I have actually had boyfriends break up with me because I didn't act Asian. <sighs> well, you're not very quiet. <laughs> you're kind of scary and intimidating with all that boxing stuff. <laughs> Is that code for you have an opinion? <laughs> you're not going to be subservient? That I could kick your ass? What? Why would I act Asian, whatever that means? I was brought up here in California. I had no Asian relatives living near me except for my mom. My closest relatives, my large extended family, all Tejanos, the food, the culture I was surrounded by, clearly not Asian or Inuit or whatever folks imagine me to be. Believe it or not, I still run into people. I could be talking for, to a person for hours, then suddenly they ask me, so where are you from? I imagine that the burning question of my race has been on their minds. But I don't take it as a reflection on me anymore. It's a reflection on them. Also, as tired as I am of explaining myself, I try to be a little more forgiving. Perhaps this boob likes me and just is trying to get to know more about me, just doesn't know how to go about it. But I think things are changing. I look around and I see more beautiful people of every shade, shape, and ethnicity. They seem more comfortable in their own skin. Also, I have changed. I am not that insecure, self-loathing young lady anymore. I've been through a lot, and I've accomplished a lot. I earn scholarships, first in my family to earn a college degree. I'm retired from a successful career. I married the love of my life, my dearest John. He died, and I survived it. And I'm not just surviving, I'm thriving. I look back at this photo of myself, and this is pre-Photoshop, pre-digital cameras. And I say, hey, I wasn't bad looking at all. I am continuing to learn. I am doing new things I never thought I would do. Dancing and writing, modeling for photos whenever I can, and now I'm speaking in front of you. <laughs> sure, I feel like I'm aging pretty fast, but I'm fighting it tooth and nail. But let me tell you, I am way more forgiving about my looks. I even catch myself saying, hey, you don't look so bad for your age. <laughs> it must be this Asian skin. <laughs> I used to be camera shy. Now I have plenty of photographer friends that need a model from time to time. And I am always volunteering. I have my photos taken whenever I can something I would never have done even as late as my 40s. I get my makeup and hair done by makeup artists and hairstylists. <sighs> Still, hairstylists want to curl my hair every time. 
I'm beginning to accept myself, though, my appearance as uniquely beautiful. I am fitting into a society that is looking much more diverse. But sadly, as I have been gaining confidence and acceptance, I started hearing about attacks on Asians. Fear, anxiety, anger directed against Asians is on a sharp rise. My last modeling favor for my friend was in 2021. I'm in the middle of having my makeup and hair done. My stepmom calls me in a panic. Lizzie, be careful, I love you. A man killed eight Asian ladies. I'm scared, don't go out. I was already sick of hearing about all this crazy shit going on. Grown men sucker punching Asian senior citizen? What the fuck, cowards? I stopped. I checked the news on my phone. And sure enough, some crazy ass white racist motherfucker went out and killed eight Asian ladies. I feel this kind of violence against women is all too common, especially Asian women. They are often fetishized, not seen as human, but rather objects. I instantly thought back to the times I was called Chinese doll, and it feels so creepy. My stomach turns. Stop! I don't want my hair curled. Make it look as straight as possible, as Asian as possible, I told the hairstylist. But honey, it looks so much nicer. Fuck it! <laughs> Some spineless piece of shit wants me to be afraid? To make me hate myself? I'm not going back there. I am strong beautiful, and I could still kick some ass. I ain't afraid of nobody, and I love me. To the core, I love me. I love you too. Thank you. <laughs> so here I am, and I say to you, and you, and you, and you, to everyone, love yourself. Don't wait. You are like me, and I am like you, unique and beautiful. And if you want to know where I'm from, I was born in Corpus Christi, Texas. <laughs>
uh, more faces of color in our audience. So many that the people of South Park driving by will think the neighborhood is about to get de-gentrified. Now, if you take a look on the back of your programs, you'll see a list of our upcoming shows, or maybe it's on the, no, it's on the back of our program. In our program, the, the pink piece of paper, yeah, the program. Uh, take a look at that. You'll take a look at our upcoming shows. Uh, after uh, this vamp, we have our April vamp uh, entitled Mandatory Fun. Uh, who's gone on those mandatory fun trips? Who has gone on a trip that was supposed to be fun? Who's gone on trips both literally and figuratively? When has it been mandatory and when has it been uh, voluntary? Get your stories in, ladies and gentlemen, and everyone else, fam. Uh, that's the, that, that show is taking place Thursday, April 28th at 8 o'clock, and that submission deadline for your stories is April 3rd. Is that like this upcoming this weekend? That's up this upcoming weekend, fam. And like, check it out, check it out, check it out. Some of y'all may be like, oh, that's too quick, fam. I can't even get that story out there. That's too quick. I got stuff to do. But check it out. <laughs> This, did you hear that whole process I went through that you go through in your stories? Get a story in, and our job between submission and showtime is to get that story together. You'd be surprised at the pieces that come together, uh, you know, that get submitted, that by the time we come up here, man, they just tight. I mean, you heard that first half, right? Right? So anyway, uh, even if you got like an inkling of a story, you got something out there, let's get that submission going. Okay, fam. We also have, uh, as you see on the back, long story short, coming up uh, with the theme, Press Pause. That is our live storytelling event, uh, improv story event, off the top of your head, not necessarily long and planned out as we have here, but a lot of times that's where the germs of vamp stories begin. So that's where if you got like, a, mm, mm, like an inkling up here and you're like, is that really a story? Long story short is the place to check that out. So please, please, let's hear your stories. In addition to our live events, So Say We All publishes a number of books that spotlight local authors. I'd like to turn your attention towards the book table in the back and introduce two people you'll want to meet before you leave tonight. First, give a warm welcome to one of our newest So Say We All board members, Miss Annalise Shoops. Give it up, ladies and gentlemen. Give it up, fam. Give it up. The lovely lady next to her is a nonprofit badass in her own right. She is my wife, uh, Nicole Markell. Give it up, give it up for my wife, Nicole, at the book table. <laughs> Feel free to keep her name in your fucking mouth as you purchase one of these fine books. This is just a sampling of what we got back there. I couldn't even bring them all up here, fam. I was like, yo, let me just get a sample. Let me just give them a little taste, a little moose boost. We got the whole alphabet, a collection of writings from LGBTQ, uh, LGBTQ community writers. Get that out there, folks. We have incoming collection of stories from our veteran writers, folks. And we have uh, uh, the Far East, a collection of writings from uh, authors coming out of, of southeastern San Diego. So we try to do things, fam. We're trying to do it, you know what I'm saying? We're trying to get a good reflection of our community, and we want to hear from you as well. We want to have you submitting, but uh, for tonight, we want you purchasing, fam, okay? So when you go back there, please, please introduce yourselves and grab you a book on your way out, or two or three. <laughs> Lastly, I want to remind you that So Say We All offers education, outward, outreach programs, specifically targeting communities who lack access or are underrepresented by mainstream media. Our teaching artists have worked with uh, several, several social services such as the Braille Institute, Penn USA, the Veterans Writers Group, Southern California American Indian Resource Center, Father Joe's Village, San Diego Public and County Libraries, and many, many more, fam. We out here. We just out here doing it, okay? But check it out. Here's the pitch. We can't do it without any of you. All right. Our goal per vamp is to get about $1,000 in donations from our, uh, our folks in our audience checking us out. And so far, fam, we've gotten just cash alone, not counting Venmo. We hit like that 800 mark, fam. Okay. We hit that 800 mark. We getting that money, all right? Let's get that, let's let that, that sh money come from that guilt just rain, fam. Let's get that guilt sh money. Uh, 
So uh, our publishing, our teaching efforts, all of these shows that we produce, including the VAMP show you are enjoying right now, are put on almost entirely by volunteers and run almost entirely off of donations. And let me ask you this, I mean, are you having a good time tonight? I said, are you having a good time tonight? Okay, okay. Well, if you like what you've seen, if you enjoy the experience, and you enjoy keeping the arts alive in San Diego, that's right. Just to give it up for the arts of San Diego, please. Please, please give a little money to Brent at the door. If you've already given, thank you. And, and, and please, don't worry. We won't get offended if you give a little bit more. All right. Uh, as always, we're happy to get the kind of money that jingles, but we'd rather get the kind of money that folds or crip walks. I don't know what money does these days. Uh, but please, please give up that cash. We got cash, we got Venmo, we got Square on those books. I mean, come on. The excuses are minimal, fam, okay? We also got, what's up, what's happening on the back? Don't we have a... Uh, uh, QR code in the back of our program? I thought we did. Did I make that up? We do. Okay. You know, join our website. You know what I'm saying? Become a monthly subscriber as well. A monthly member, rather. Uh, jump in. Give us those nations. You know, keep this alive, right? The more you keep us alive, help us. we help keep the city alive, the arts alive. It's, you know what I'm saying? It's all symbiotic. All right? Let's do that. Let's do that. Uh, let's see. Thank you so much. Lastly, we love you, and we are glad that you're here tonight. So thank you. Thank you once again. All right, all right. Let's get that second half. All right, let me get that. Let me get that loud clap that we was doing earlier for that second half. Okay. Our next reader coming to the stage is no stranger to the vamp stage. She's a joker, a smoker, a midnight stoker. She sure don't want to hurt no one unless you come at her with that bullshit. Ladies and gentlemen, let's get some love for Deborah D. Bash. Jonathan's argument caught me off guard. It was our second date, fifth conversation, and I was snuggled, snuggled up in the corner of his cozy leather couch, watching the night sky over the beach from his living room window. I had a glass of red wine in my hand, and I was feeling flirty. But he, he persisted. Look at the number of black doctors today versus the 1900s. You can't deny the progress. The evening started with Indian food and making fun of the recent Bee Gees documentary. Then the late nine conversation wandered from witty nonsense into a political minefield. The topic, how great it was to be black in 2021. Jonathan, who is not black, had come to the conclusion that being black was vastly improved by every measure that he cared to count. And he wanted me to corroborate his belief that this whole business about racial injustice and strife was but a minor nuisance and soon to be squashed for good. Jonathan looks a bit like Jason Statham, the British anti-hero known for being averagely handsome. I don't know why Jonathan mentioned doctors to make his point. It was random, but maybe he had seen that viral meme, a tweeted image of 15 black medical school graduates standing in front of a former concentration camp for enslaved Africans. Some call it a plantation, but that's just one of too many words that make brutality sound quaint. The doctor photo was actually something I knew a little bit about because I'm a nerd and a former journalist, and as they say, my people are from Louisiana, so I pay attention when it's mentioned. Most of the stories about the viral post were hopeful and very celebratory. Definitely, I definitely hearted more than a few hashtag our ancestors' wildest dreams posts. But only a few stories noted, as I shared with Jonathan, that in reality, the percentage of US doctors who are black has barely risen in the past 120 years. And almost no story noted that black women account for most of the increase because the number of black male doctors is currently in decline. Why is both complicated and not at all complicated? 
Scientifically, biological race does not exist. It is a social invention. That's why intelligence exists equally across every so-called race, gender, socioeconomic, religious, and ethnic group, according to common sense and research. <laughs> it is only opportunity that does not exist equally according to world events. Jonathan did not like my answer, but apparently he still thought I was cute. He texted me the next day. I was polite, but I didn't make an effort to keep the conversation going. This was not my first Jonathan. <laughs> it was a, <laughs> I was about 28 when I first dated a white guy. Not dating white guy was, not dating white guys was not necessarily intentional. The men I attracted just tended to be melanated. But there was a time in college when I thought I'd never date a white guy. A classmate from Nigeria and I agreed that they seem like a lot of work. <laughs> I once used the analogy of walking next to someone who's floating six inches off the ground and doesn't understand why you're so damn tired after a day of hiking up steep hills and through muddy canyons. But in hindsight, that analogy isn't fair. And maybe it's more like two people carrying book bags, one weighted down with textbooks and the other carrying a few, a few paperbacks. After all, not all white guys float. <laughs> Jonathan is entitled to his opinion about race in America, but he doesn't get to mansplain social progress to me. My mother drank from a coloreds only water fountain in the 1950s. I'm sure that too was celebrated as progress because it is the same water. Jonathan's argument grated on me and I knew it was best to walk away and not look back. That was Thursday. <laughs> Saturday afternoon, he sent me a 200 word good morning text that arrived at 1.23 in the afternoon. In it, he outlined five key points. <laughs> points two through five were about an early 2000s R&B singer, the yacht rock music genre, <laughs> a movie recommendation, and his confession that he spent 45 minutes composing the text. I'll just read the first point. <laughs> What follows is from the actual text exchange. I did not alter his words, but in some cases I trimmed for brevity and clarity. <laughs> I looked up a few articles on the shortage of black male doctors, and while I agree, the data roughly show that there are slightly fewer African, male, African American male doctors now, in my humble opinion, there is actually quite a bit of nuance to the story. Therefore, I conclude the issue does not seem to merit um, a good logical basis for complete pessimism. Sorry, exclamation point. You said you wanted to meet a person who views the world with a little optimism and curiosity. Guess what? You got him. I think he was trying to be charming, <laughs> but I'm not a pessimist. I am a realist and it tickles my ivories when people think a handful of black doctors and lawyers erases the wealth gap <laughs> and countless disparities in this country. I knew it was better not to respond. I knew this was a trap, but his pious taunt worked. Four hours later, I thanked him for his note, but said I would not thank him for the link to Yacht Rock. It's horrible. <laughs> then I warmed him to read the message at his own risk. He had mentioned in a prior phone conversation that my contradictory tone uh, or opinions about the state of black people in America had triggered him. This is not an argument I wanted to have. 
I said it's great that he wants to look to the world with optimism about the potential to correct centuries of deeply entrenched prejudice and oppression. I have reality. Tiny little slights and mishaps that affect me, my career, and my ability to just exist on a daily basis. I don't need platitudes about how great everything is because in 1900, 1.3% of doctors were black, and in 2018, 5.4% were. I told him that he didn't have to convince me that it was great to be black. Social construct or not, I love being black. I do not see it as a burden. I see the rest of the world as fucked up, but I absolutely 100% would not choose to be anything other than exactly who I am, or Oprah. I would totally choose to be Oprah. Has there been progress? Yes. Has there been enough? Absolutely not. Should we be happy that it's now egregious and not whistle at a white woman in the street homicidal? Jonathan called himself an optimist. Great. Tell that to the homeless guy on my block yelling, I hate N-words at the top of his lungs because he thinks that as bad as he has it, at least he's not one of those. And yes, I know that dude probably has mental issues, even though it's not a pleasant spectator experience. I haven't always been the girl who speaks up for herself and have a pile of regrets about micro and macro aggressions that I did not respond to because I knew that it was safer or smarter to say nothing lest I be labeled angry. I was surprised to be having this particular disagreement with Jonathan because did he really care so vehemently about whether the full potential of black people was soon to be realized? Or did he think having a disagreement with, about race with a black woman somehow threatened his woke white man card? Jonathan has the luxury of trusting. <laughs> that things will be better, eventually. I don't. If true justice and equality, equality emerged from kindness, compassion, or optimism, that would have happened already. I told Jonathan that I absolutely believe and see the world is changing and improving every single day. I also believe the robot overlords will handle this better because they know biology and statistics and they won't care what brown cream or tan shell we come in. I wrote over 750 words. Jonathan responded three hours later with five words, two punctuation marks and an emoji. Okay, comma. Thanks for your perspective, period. White thumbs up. Oh. Yeah. When I read the message to a friend, she said what I'd been thinking. Damn, that's like white people code for fuck off. <laughs> Lesson learned. I did not respond. Still going. Hey, Deborah, was thinking about you this morning. How you doing? I truly hadn't expected to hear from him, so I said I was confused, but good. Okay, glad to hear. I thought a fair bit about the text you sent me. It didn't seem like you in it was intended to spark discussion, so I wasn't really sure how, what to reply to. Finally, I came to the conclusion that I'd probably learn the most by asking you the following question. <laughs> what would be the perfect reply that you would like to receive? that would validate the effort your thumbs put into composing that message. Your reply above, all above indicates that maybe I was right and that you weren't trying to evoke a response. 
Of course, I did already reply. <laughs> Not sure if you got it. I thanked you for your perspective. <laughs> you remember the bike phone? Okay. <laughs> I didn't hear back from you, so from my side, it was actually you who stopped the conversation. Anyway, I was thinking about you this morning because I was packing my car to go surfing at 5.30 this morning, and a homeless man rode by me and said, have fun, and then yelled a derogatory term insinuating that Jonathan might be homosexual. <laughs> Jonathan ended the sentence by inserting a crying, laughing face emoji. Then he said, there you have it a fun little experience that made me think of you <laughs> and prompted me to reach out. Please help me out by understanding what is the best possible response that you could possibly have received. If you thought it was fun, I I'd even invite you to compose it in my voice. Thanks, exclamation point. I snapped a screenshot, <laughs> sent it to another friend. We agreed that this definitely felt like a men are from Mars and women are not moment. <laughs> Me writing a response to myself sounds about as satisfying as a side hug. <laughs> I'll be honest. I still thought maybe writing back to Jonathan would spark some light bulb moment. And he'd realize that maybe he doesn't understand everything about being black in America. But Jonathan wasn't trying to learn. He was too busy trying to win. Nevertheless, I wrote and explained that there wasn't a perfect answer, but I would have appreciated a message that reflected some sign of humility, genuine empathy, and understanding. Good morning. Thanks again for your response. I agree that we have different modes of communication, possibly even orthogonal. I had to look that word up. <laughs> it, it means at right angles. Anyway, he continued. I personally won't attribute it to gender because I don't find that to be a productive line of reasoning. Heck, some people think gender is as much a construct as race. I'll leave that to them to decide. But I found that in practice, most people prefer to be addressed as individuals, not a series of demographic boxes that they check. Yes, I actually am triggered by almost every communication that we've had, including the most recent text. And yes, even when I first met you in the park, there, to me, it sounded like you were insinuating that I was stupid for not wearing a bicycle helmet, when in fact I had considered very seriously whether or not I wanted to wear my helmet that day. I do not remember that. <laughs> he then conceded, I am willing to chalk it up to different communication styles rather than actual ill intent on your part. Doesn't matter. I have persisted thus far because we have enough commonalities to possibly build a friendship, but different enough perspectives that I might learn something. Asking you to construct the perfect response was a genuine intent, attempt at learning and growth on my part. What does a white whale tell a person who says that white whales can't tell them anything? And yes, I just have to say, I thought white whales was a typo too. <laughs> but he just kept using the phrase, capital W white, capital W whale. He explained that in situations like this, white whales either give up or wise white whales ask a question and try to learn more. <laughs> then Jonathan reached his final conclusion. Most of what you wrote was an expression of pain. And as you explained, you want that pain to be acknowledged. I hereby acknowledge you. I am indeed sorrowful for and empathetic to your pain. I tried to act, vote, and organize with that in mind. Okay, that's about all the time my effort and effort my thumbs can afford. I give up for now. So I'll end by saying I have learned a few things. 
have a great week, and I hope you meet the kind of people you need to here in San Diego. Vaya con tacos. Taco emoji, sunset emoji. I thought about responding with, don't call me Ishmael. <laughs> but I didn't. No. That was our last exchange. <laughs> I read a book once on the righteous mind by another guy named Jonathan. It discusses why it's virtually impossible to change what people believe because beliefs are not logical and most people are perfectly comfortable holding blatantly contradictory beliefs. White whale Jonathan wanted to agree <laughs> it's always novel, to disagree. <laughs> he thought his optimism was a gift that could ease the pain that he hereby acknowledged but his optimism felt dismissive. I don't carry the same load my mom did, but I carry a much different load than Jonathan for reasons that won't be resolved in my lifetime. My pain isn't what he thinks. It's not pessimism. My pain is my optimism, my hopefulness and my ability to see the world's potential. My confidence that someday in the future, people will joke about us the way we joke about cave dwellers. At every stage of civil rights progress, good-hearted white folks have said, isn't it great how far we've come and expected us black folks to be grateful? How many failing to recognize that anything short of appreciating our full, complete, God-given humanness is unacceptable? Jonathan called himself a white whale, and now I think it was Freudian that maybe he sees himself as the object of an obsessive pursuit, not realizing that he's only a focus because he's standing in the way. The only pursuit of reciprocity is justice and fairness, not revenge. Jonathan's reluctance or, ignor or ignorance about acknowledging the precarious state of race relations is telling. It's the kind of ignorance lurking beneath the surface of modern civility that um, James Baldwin called the most ferocious enemy justice can have. But Baldwin was also, had also great faith in humanity. Trust life and it will teach you in joy and in sorrow. So I'll leave you with an odd bit of joy. Last week, as I was preparing this talk and researching Jason Statham, <laughs> for purely professional reasons, the guy, that's the guy who Jonathan sort of looks like, I found out that Jason is in a sequel to a film I've never heard of. In it, he battles a giant white prehistoric fish. I know it's a stretch, but I just had to tell you. <laughs> I don't know exactly what the universe is saying with this bizarre message, but I think it means that we have to keep our sense of humor, face the demons lurking deep in the past, or there will be awful sequels for years to come. <laughs> And that is Deborah Bass. Give it up. Oh, thank you. When the Black Lives Matter protests happened, and I started to learn so late in my life about the systemic oppression of people of color in the United States, I felt ashamed. I felt ashamed that I didn't know more about it. I felt blindsided by the intense racial disparity people of color endure every day, all the time. I learned about things like the dismantling of Black Wall Street, 
the seizing of black property without calls, cause, the Tulsa massacre, which, by the way, I learned about when viewing the HBO show Watchmen. I thought it was an alternative history when they presented it in the show. And then I Googled it. And uh, it was unfortunately true. <clears throat> With this newfound perspective, I started to see the adoption of my youngest sister, Anne, through a totally different lens. Now, Anne is biracial, born from a white mom who was 16 at the time, and a black man. I likely would never have met her except that my parents belonged to a charismatic Catholic group in the 1970s. I was 13. My mom, born Catholic, converted my dad when they married, and then they found this movement of Catholics who were tired of the boring old traditions and dusty dogma of the church. They wanted something more spiritual, less religious, something edgy, something they embraced the real Jesus, the one we all had on our walls in those days, a kind-eyed hippie dude with a feathered Farrah Fawcett haircut and well-trimmed facial hair. <laughs> As part of this spiritual renewal, the members of my parents' Holy Spirit community had purchased houses in the same neighborhood, had prayer meetings at different houses weekly, and regularly did charity work reaching out to foreign ministries to help starving kids in other countries or to support Catholic work, Catholic mission work. And all these good, white, middle-class Christians adopted biracial kids. Why? Well, these kids, neither black nor white, were considered difficult adoptions. White parents tended not to want mixed race kids and black parents often faced huge barriers to adoption in general. So the kids frequently languished in foster homes until they were 18. Now my parents and their prayer group saw these adoptions as walking the walk. They wanted to help people in a real tangible way, not just talk about doing good works. As a young teenager, I wasn't that excited about another younger sister. I already had two sisters, and they were a pain in the neck. And one more kid meant sharing the little space we had in our house and possibly nixing the idea that I might finally get my own room. But as my parents said, we had plenty, we had room, and this three-year-old girl needed a place to live. They did not go looking for another kid. They were contacted by Catholic charities and specifically asked to adopt this seemingly unplaceable girl. Now, when we first met Anne, she was three. She lived in a foster home in a small town about an hour from where we lived. When we arrived at the house for the first time, a house crammed full of 10 other foster kids she hid from us. When we did finally meet her, she seemed really sad. A little girl whose beautiful fine hair had been buzzed to an inch to keep it easier to brush, wearing a red shirt two sizes too small that exposed her round belly. Her hazel eyes were distrustful. We wanted to talk to Anne and play with her, but she was totally silent. She'd learned not to talk too much and still carries a slight stutter when she's flustered. It seemed like it might not be a great idea bringing in someone we didn't know from a place we'd barely seen. But again, my parents wanted to do something good for someone else, so after several visits and much discussion, we made one final trip to bring Anne home. She came with one small suitcase containing all her belongings. And when we, got my, when we got home, my mom unpacked the few things in it and tucked the suitcase under the bed in my parents' room. This is where our few pieces of luggage went. We had very few occasions to use them since we rarely traveled. My dad was a postal worker and my mom stayed home. 
So we had no extra money for lavish or even not so lavish vacations. Now we suspected that Anne had been damaged from her time in foster care. We found out later that her 16 year old white mom had given her up for adoption a dozen times and then changed her mind. So Anne had been ping pong back and forth more in her first three years than most kids are in a lifetime. Her dad, a black man who had fathered several other kids with different moms was not in the picture. And when Anne first came to us, she spent the first several weeks coloring scribbles with nothing but black crayons. Now one night, <clears throat> my friend had asked me to sleep over, so I thought that I could use Anne's tiny suitcase. I got it out from under the bed, um, and Anne saw me. She stood there and she asked, am I leaving again? When she saw the suitcase, she knew it was time for her to go yet again. Even at 13, as self-absorbed as I was, I knew that this was heartbreaking. I explained I was just gonna use it for a sleepover with a friend and she wasn't going anywhere. She didn't show any emotion, just stoic acceptance and a nod. She went back to scribbling with her black crayon. I'd love to say that the rest of her life was amazing and this adoption transformed her and you know maybe it did a little. She was safe and fed and had a roof over her head. My sisters and I <laughs> included her in playing, introduced her around the neighborhood and eventually she got more comfortable. But as an adult, I looked back and I saw that we as a family had systematically erased her blackness without even knowing it. She was part of our family, but when we went shopping, people never hesitated to frown at my mom and ask why she had that N-word baby in the stroller. Well, there was no good reply. In 1970s Ohio, <laughs> my 13-year-old self was not about to speak up. And although it angered my mom, she didn't want to cause a fight in a shopping mall, so she usually just ignored the comments and walked on, smiling as if she hadn't heard. But we heard, and so did Anne. We never talked about her blackness. We assimilated her into our family, thinking that was the kind thing to do. I am sure my parents thought so. Doing that and trying to make her one of us, we erased who she had been. We denied her heritage. We expected her to behave like us, to like the things that we liked, to eat the things that we ate. My other age sisters and I were very musical and we liked reading and did not like those things. She found great success in sports, whereas none of the rest of us kids had any, I mean any, athletic ability. <laughs> We were really good at school, we got really good grades, Anne was not and didn't. And I'm sure being the fourth kid in a line of star students was not an easy thing to deal with. We were all people pleasers and she was not. Instead of seeing these things as perhaps, perhaps inevitable differences, my parents saw them as traits to be smoothed out and hidden. Conformity was important. As she got older, this became more of a point of friction. Anne liked music that none of the rest of us liked. She started to hang out with black kids at school. And it felt dangerous to my parents because from what they could see, the black kids got in trouble. When a white kid smoked in a bathroom, they needed counseling. When a black kid did it, they got suspended. When a white kid skipped class, they got to talk with the principal and then were sent back to class. When a black kid skipped class, they were suspended. Look at these statistics from 2015 and you can see that not much has really changed. When she was a teenager, she wanted to know about her birth parents, Anne did, and my mom was terribly insulted. She felt like she'd sacrificed a lot of her life to save Anne. 
and that the desire to find her birth parents was a slap in the face. Anne fought with them more and more and rebelled at their need for her to be like the rest of us. <laughs> they tried in their way to get help. A social worker came calling once every six months, but there was really no counseling or race awareness or sensitivity training in the 70s in Ohio. As we became adults, it was clear from the way my other two sisters talked that they thought any of the problems that Anne had were directly caused by her blackness. She got into debt. She bought stuff she couldn't afford, like brand new cars and expensive shoes. She quit jobs regularly and moved frequently. And all of these things were implicitly caused by her blackness, but the commentary was very subtle. This is the under the radar racism that was endemic to where I grew up. For example, there were these knowing sighs and the shaking of heads when the topic of Anne came up. Well, you know how she is about money, one sister would say, rolling her eyes. And she wouldn't listen to me. Or, well, she just had to go and buy that ridiculous fur coat. She couldn't afford it. It's so ghetto, said another. Well, when you have a couple of baby daddies, that's what's going to happen. When her second son was born from a different man from the first. The assumptions became the beliefs that became the truth. If I expressed an opinion about Anne's situation that was counter to my sister's observation, I just didn't understand, because I had moved to California at 23. You know, the land of fruits and nuts. <laughs> they told me Anne had been in a small traffic accident, and she was fine, and immediately they chalked it up to her being careless. And when I said, well, um, didn't you also get in a fender bender on the freeway when you started to drive in Columbus? The subject was changed. Did I push it? Did I insist on this discussion? No, I did not. My family was all about keeping things polite, not making waves, and my opinion had lost all consideration because I left. As the Black Lives Matter protests grew and spread, I saw the adoption of my sister through a different lens. All the well-meaning neighbors who had adopted biracial kids in my parents' friend group were doing it for noble reasons, but then they failed those kids by not honoring their heritage or their ancestry. We tried to erase who they were, not purposefully, but by well-intentioned neglect. We wanted them to be us because being us was the way to be successful. Being the other led to drug addiction, poverty, crime, violence. It was a misbegotten but well-intentioned thing, but it was wrong at the root. I realized that my family and I were some of those good-hearted white folks. I called my sister, who now lives in Arizona, and I told her this. I told her that finally I saw and acknowledged the subtle and not so subtle racism that she'd been subjected to in our house, in our town, in our school, in our state. I told her I hadn't seen all of it at the time, and now I was beginning, beginning to understand. I wanted to apologize, to take it back, to do it over, but of course, that's not possible. We cried together over the phone. Then she started to share photos with me, photos of her birth family, to whom she had connected when she became an adult. She had several sisters, a brother, a mom and a dad who are now old and changed over time as we all do. She shared this part of her life with me, a part we as a family in the 70s had never even acknowledged or considered. I hope that we've made something of a bridge to start forging a real relationship. And I hope she's forgiven us for the mistakes we made with good intentions. I worry for her two sons going out in this world as black men. I think of all the things that happened in the past and how most of them were meant as kindness but were tinged with ignorance. I know now that none of these questions about race are simple, black, and white. 
and I'm grateful that I finally saw it and talked about it with my sister, Anne. Thank you. Give it up for Laura Preble. Want to hear a scary story? It takes place in a haunted house called the nonprofit sector. <laughs> Next to raising awareness, reposting a change.org petition, and visiting a foreign country to snap pictures with children whose skin tone is a far cry from their own pasty complexions, we Caucasians go gaga, absolutely mad, over four numbers and one lowercase letter. 501c3. Mm. The ghoulish nonprofit entity that I work for has a lot to offer in the well intentioned world of children's theater. To protect the innocent, I can't tell you the name of the actual organization, only to say that it was inspired by a movie starring sexual predator Kevin Spacey. For this tale of nonprofit terror, it will be known only as. Kevin's kids. <laughs> the teaching artists and volunteer mentors of Kevin's kids work in underfunded schools and high needs communities, as well as with youth in juvenile prisons, foster care, and other places where nobody gives a shit. Who cares about kids? Kevin does. On a crisp sheet of white paper, Kevin's kids appears to be doing good. But take a closer look, and you'll see that from the inception of the original mission statement, this company was baptized in the waters of white saviorism. Because while most of the teaching artists, partners, and participants are PGM and BIPOC, the majority of the staff and board are MCA and M&M. Upon my arrival at Kevin's Kids, I quickly noticed that the organization had only one single solitary member who wasn't white. The white executive director, who for this horror yarn shall be referred to only as Green Book Gretchen, didn't seem to notice or care. She was too busy serving the underprivileged. Abiding by her personal philosophy, it was mandatory that every meeting Every workshop, every program begin with a check-in. State your name? Absolutely. Rate how you're feeling on a scale of one to 10? You'd better believe it. Say your pronouns and answer a daily fun question like, if you were a soup, what type of soup would you be? <laughs> Damn right, you non-conforming ham and split pea. And yet, with all this fuss placed on safety and inclusion, Green Book Gretchen was oblivious to the fact that she was the orchestrator of a nonprofit nightmare. Scared yet? This tour of nonprofit horror has just begun. Within a short time of my hiring, I noticed that Green Book Gretchen had a habit of talking down to people who were not white. Her dismissal of racial matters became more apparent when she flat out stated that Kevin's kids shouldn't post a statement of solidarity or support during the Black Lives Matter movement. She dismissed any notion of racism on her part, especially when it came to her job. Take, for instance, the annual company gala. Each spring, Kevin bussed his black and brown kids into affluent neighborhoods for the wealthy elite to throw dollars at the organization. Oh then gave those same kids the slip out the back door before dinner was served. To most of the staff, this was considered uh, racist. Uh, very racist. Not Klansmen burning a cross on the front lawn racist, more like Karen racist. Green Book Gretchen didn't even blink when one day the only black staff member simply disappeared. Gone into the ether, never to be heard from again. That was the end of program director number one. Program director number two came along a few months later. This time, it was a young black man who moved all the way across the country in the midst of a pandemic to work for Kevin's kids. 
He navigated Green Book Gretchen's white workspace for five months before quitting. Exiting her haunted mansion of altruism, this man made sure to call out the organization as racist on Instagram, even tagging Green Book Gretchen in the post. <laughs> Nevertheless, that was the end of program director number two. I was mortified by all of this happening in less than a year's time. I also felt frustrated, not to mention helpless in my position. My job, like in many nonprofit roles, forced me to straddle many circles. I had one foot in with the teaching artists and staff, one foot in with the administration, but no real power or say in either realm. Kevin's kids locked me in the industrial pantry of middle management. I screamed for someone to open the door in emails, in person, on Zoom calls, but every attempt to sound the alarm was thwarted by Green Book Gretchen, who plugged her ears and turned it all into white noise. <laughs> Program director number three was hired a short while later, this time a black woman from the community. On her first day, it became clear that Green Book Gretchen had not told her one detail about the fate of her predecessors. Zip, zero, nothing. When I informed Program director number three of the entire racist saga, she stepped up. Like a boss, she organized an open discussion about race at the company's annual fall training. Of course, Green Book Gretchen did not even think to attend this discussion, nor did any members of the board. Months passed since program director number two's Instagram post had gone out in the world, but all the higher-ups at Kevin's Kids had said nothing. No public statement, no calls to action, no real reform within the company. Dead silence. By the time summer ended, our teaching artists were done. Their answer to Green Book Gretchen's indifference? A formalized strike. No programs, no workshops, no Kevin, no kids. This got Green Book Gretchen's attention. Due to the strike, she decided to finally open her mouth to address the situation at hand, only to broker the most ungraceful partnership between her foot and her mouth. This routine of hers continued for months, getting defensive, taking it personally, speaking instead of listening. She defended the legacy of the company, even though me and my colleagues had unearthed some damning evidence of inappropriate practices. Like a play Kevin's kids produced back in the day called Ass Naked. Just take a look at the cast list for Ass Naked. We had such well-defined characters as butt, sex, and bitch Juanita. White people, this is some freaky shit for a theater company for kids. <laughs> Green Book Gretchen tried to cast a magical spell, but her witchy ways meant things went from bad to really racist. The teaching artist formed an independent council demanding that Kevin's kids become anti-racist, anti-colonial, and abolitionist in all aspects of the company. This was met with every white person in leadership scoffing, how could we be the villains in this scenario? We run a nonprofit. All of us are here to serve and save the poor melanated children of the inner city. <laughs> this prompted the teaching artist to demand Green Book Gretchen's resignation, which she did not give. Instead, she responded that Kevin's kids would have a company-wide diversity, equity, and inclusion training. She wouldn't be there, of course. <laughs> Neither would the board of directors, naturally. Just everyone else, all of us taking turns, yelling at our Zoom camera for three days straight, I am not a racist, but sometimes I say and do racist things. The taxing, overworking, underpaying, and gaslighting demons of Kevin haunted us day and night. Going to work now consisted of Kevin's kids screaming at each other, tears of anguish constantly running down cheeks, and everyone in a position of power insisting that they couldn't be held accountable just because their privilege was the same color as a g g g ghost. 
Under program director number three's leadership, we as a united staff outlined an organizational transformation at Kevin's Kids, one that would allow us to constantly stop asking, what's in the box? And think outside of it. <laughs> Green Book Gretchen turned a blind eye to all of it. She didn't acknowledge the labor, emotional and beyond, that program director number three had put into making these significant reforms. Systematic changes that wouldn't just end the teaching artist strike, but would also benefit every employee regardless of what soup they identified as. <laughs> Green Book Gretchen killed the plan. And with it, every ounce of hope that program director number three had inspired amongst all of us. Blood everywhere, sliced and diced dreams strung up as demented Hollywood, or Halloween decorations around Green Book Gretchen's office. So, like the two who came before her, program director number three quit, just shy of her 90-day review. That's three program directors, all black, all gone within 18 months. I was devastated, exhausted, wanting to quit every day. Despite program director number three's departure, the teaching artist somehow agreed on a set of terms to resume work. The only condition was that Green Book Gretchen would step down as executive director. Much to everyone's shock and dismay, she agreed to resign. And just like that, Green Book Gretchen evaporated into the pale mist of the beyond. But her spirit came back for one final haunting when she named a new program director, me. Me? Fuck me. <laughs> of all people, Kevin's Kids now has me as program director number four, the fucking white guy. I'm just as chilled to the bone as you are. I'm worried this wasn't the right decision. I'm freaked out about being able to take this position of leadership. And every day that I go to work now, I can't help but look into the black mirror of my laptop in it, I catch glimpses of my face, questioning if it is just grotesquely morphing into Green Book Gretchen or worse, just possessed by the terrifying heart of whiteness that is nonprofit work. The horror, the horror. <laughs> because programs are returning. Fundraising is ramping up. Kevin, like the white messiah zombie he believes himself to be, has risen. All the while, me and the rest of the staff have been lured into this killing machine, hypnotized to do its bidding. But the only difference is now I'm part of the machine, bigger and scarier than I ever was. The call is coming from inside the nonprofit house of horror, and it's me. Give it up for Jake Arkey! All right, all right, all right. Give it up one more time for our writers. Get ready to exercise your hands, ladies and gentlemen. Because that's, that's going to happen right now. Y'all finna get a little workout with them hands. Now, I want to give some props to the folks who rode through here. First of all, love that show, fam. I had the, as, a, as a producer of this show, I've had the pleasure of seeing those stories go from that little germ that I talked about earlier to get better and better and better as the weeks have gone on. Uh, and to see them uh, uh, just, just thrive today has been a great, great pleasure. So I appreciate you all. I uh, hope you guys enjoyed the show, because I know I did. I know I had a good time. I had a good time. Check it out, fam. Before you go, I want to give a special thanks to our volunteers, Jen Coburn, Bryn Hanafee. Just keep it going, fam. Eber Lambert, Annalise Toops, and the lovely Nicole Markell. Give it up. Give it up. I want to thank our coaches for helping our writers sharpen their stories and performances. Once again, give it up to Eber Lambert, Christine Nail, the Taylor Ngo, David Latham, Adam Greenfield, Brent Hanafy. Once again, folks, Louise Julig and Leo Deckham Baum Diggy. Give it up. Give it up. Give a hand to Jennifer Corley on the ones and twos. Give it up, folks. Give it up. And give one last hand for tonight's performers, the scholar T.J. Talley, the scribe Alejandro Lucero Canan, the Avenger Liz Thomas, the hunter Deborah Bass, 
the St. Laura Preble, and the Savior, Jake Arkey. Today's episode was brought to you by the letter D and the letter J and the number 12. Remember to tip your bartender. Thank you, Whistle Stop. Thank you all. Have a good night.